Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight I'm continuing in the study of the book of Proverbs, and we're going to begin with chapter 26, verse 11 tonight, and see how far I can get. Um, if you have not seen the previous studies on Proverbs, all of them are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I hope you will go back and watch this all from the beginning. Uh, now, I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read the uh, first in the KJV, and then I will may have to look at it in the Amplified. So let's begin. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Well, that's a very graphic, very memorable <laughs> verse. It's uh, very explicit, but uh, and the thought of it, it's just is sickening. Dogs returning to their vomit. Uh, it's like the dog can't resist going back and sniffing and after he vomits and maybe even eating it again. It's just I hate to even discuss the thought of it, and and yet. We know that the god, the dog, must do it for some reason. It just seems like that the god, dog is required to return to his vomit. And it says, "Just as a dog returns to his vomit, a fool returns to his folly." A person who is a fool is going to just continue repeating the same mistakes over and over again. Uh, Einstein, I believe, is credited with saying that um, insanity is when a person does the same thing over and over again but expects a different result so if you do something and you've failed i mean at least try to make some kind of an adjustment learn from your experience make some kind of correction in your behavior otherwise you know they say history is <laughs> doomed to repeat itself um, let me see how it phrases it in the amplified uh, verse 11 in the Amplified says, Like a dog that returns to his vomit of, is a fool who repeats his foolishness. Yes. It's pretty simple to understand that principle. And, uh, of course, the book of Proverbs is written so that we can learn wisdom. And uh, there's a difference between knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. These three words are used repeatedly in the, the book of Proverbs. Uh, knowledge is the most base of them and that is where you I use scriptures for example let's say I can you can you recite uh, John 316 do you do you know it yes I know that verse and you recite it so then you have knowledge but do you understand the verse understanding is a uh, higher level than than just knowledge you know you understand the meaning what the verse means and then Finally, wisdom is you not only have knowledge and understanding, but you apply the verse into your life. That's wisdom. And so this is what we hope to do from studying Proverbs. And this verse here is uh, a lesson to us that, look, don't keep on repeating yourself, or making the same mistakes over and over again. And, and uh, there's a contrast throughout the book of Proverbs over and over again, contrasting uh, the foolish man versus the wise man. The foolish man does this foolish thing and he ends up suffering some consequences for his foolishness. And the wise man makes wise decisions and therefore he gets blessings. His life is blessed because of it. So what we want to do is learn from the book of Proverbs how to be the wise man rather than the fool. So let's go to the next verse in the KJV. And it says... Verse 12, seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Um, there's another verse, uh, I can't remember where it is. Uh, I think it might be in Romans, but it's, it says they are wise in their own conceit. And I, I've, I've, one of the things that really stood out to me from studying uh, Proverbs uh, it just seems like an awful lot of these verses in Proverbs, uh, particularly Paul and uh, even Jesus, it seemed like they quote from Proverbs quite often. 
I believe Paul quoted this very verse, uh, wise in their own conceit. Um, let's, let's see how it's phrased in the Amplified before I try to explain it. That's verse 12. Do you see a man who is unteachable and wise in his own eyes and full of self-conceit? So a man who is unteachable. I, uh, you know, I've talked about this many times over the last few years, especially. And the idea that uh, now I, I've studied the Bible almost daily for 29 years. But it, it, it seemed like this year, last year, the year before, and so on, I have uh, ended up changing theological positions that I held for many years. And why did I do that? Because I'm teachable. And, and this is telling us that you, you should be a teachable person. What is a teachable person? A person whose mind is open to, to listen. But not only just listen, but give a fair hearing. Listen without just thinking of how you're going to argue and what your response is, but actually listening and considering the other person's point of view. Uh, so when you really consider the other person's point of view and you weigh it against the, the, the position you currently hold, then you should be uh, willing. There's a saying that uh, I, I have always liked this saying. It says, um, remember why we debate. Now, when I say debate, it could just be having a discussion, discussing a theology and uh, uh, arguing, not with anger, but just as an, as an attorneys argue for their, their positions. Um, remember why we debate. Uh, uh, the only thing we have to lose are the errors that we hold. I don't know about you, but if, if I'm an error, I don't want to be. And if it, it, every theological position I hold, I, I'm willing to listen to the arguments against it. And there, there have been some occasions where, because I've listened and given it been fair, they've persuaded me, they've won me over to the other side. And the, this quote that I like uh, ends with, only a stubborn fool would hold on to their errors once they've been exposed. So that's, that's what really being teachable is. Don't be a stubborn fool that just holds on to your errors. Be willing to listen, be fair, consider the other person's point of view. And, and, and if you realize that you, you've been proven wrong, then be thankful that someone's corrected you and now you, you, you've seen the light. So again, in the Amplified, that verse reads, do you see a man who is unteachable and wise in his own eyes and full of conceit? Um, I do. I see a lot of conceited Bible teachers. Um, I just had an experience the, the other day uh, meeting someone that, say, to me, came off as very arrogant, conceited, condescending, disrespectful. Uh, and, and that is a person that can't learn and also is offensive to others. Uh, the conceit, thinking that, you know, you know it all and uh, you can't learn from anybody else. And I've met a lot of people like that on YouTube, very conceited that think that uh, uh, not only, they must think that they are infallible. You know, just as Roman Catholicism teaches that the Pope is infallible. Well, there's all people I'm meeting on YouTube that seem to think they're infallible. They couldn't possibly be wrong about something. So it's their job to uh, put everybody else from the microscope and nitpick and find any fault in them and correct them because they must, they, they're wise in their own conceit. They believe they're always right. And that's very, very sad. But people like that, I, I try to disassociate from them as soon as possible. Um, but it goes on to finish the, the verse. It says, they're, they're, uh, they're wise in their own eyes and full of conceit. 
there is more hope for a fool than for him. At least a fool may, may be able to learn uh, and, and uh, because he's not necessarily conceited. He just be, may be foolish. Okay, let me go on now to the next verse, verse 13 in the KJV. The slothful man saith, there is a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. As a door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Uh, I think these two verses go together, 13 and 14. And the, the point is that uh, some people are so lazy that they'll even make up something like say, I can't get out of bed and go out, for, out my front door to go to work because there's a lion in the street. <laughs> Just make any excuse they can dream up to, to, um, so they don't have to work. That's the, the height of laziness. That's what slothful means. Let me read it in the Amplified verse uh, 13 and 14 says the lazy person who is self-indulgent and relies on lame excuses says there is a lion in the road a lion is in the open square and if i go outside to work i will be killed <laughs> as the door turns on its hinges so does the lazy person on his bed never getting out of it i don't know and it's it's 2016 in the United States of America and I'll tell you it seems to me that uh, our country has changed so much in my lifetime and I do see that many people in the country have become really lazy they're not willing to work uh, see people still want to come here from all over the world because the world sees America as still the land of opportunity if a person is willing to be honest and work hard and you know they think they, they can succeed and there's no limit and it, that is that is a fact it there is opportunity here and freedom but it seems like some of our natural born citizens here they take it all for, for granted and, and and they just want everything handed to them and in the book of wisdom we it, we, we we again it, it contrasts the lazy person is going to be in poverty the diligent hard-working person is going to be successful um, it's just a fact it will work out if you are willing to work hard and you are uh, determined and persistent and uh, you're going to succeed let me look at this uh, let me see back to the kjv um, verse 15 says the slothful hideth his hand in his bosom it grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth hmm hideth his hand in his bosom it grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth is that he's too lazy to even lift up his food to his mouth that would be the amazing uh degree of laziness let's see how it's stated in the the amplified the lazy person buries his hand in the dish losing opportunity after opportunity he worries him to bring it back to his mouth <laughs> how lazy is the person that they're too lazy to even lift the food up to their to their mouth uh, i hope that doesn't apply to anybody watching this but there's a Almost all of our problems, there are simple solutions. And uh, the, the solution for this lazy man is just get off your butt, get out of bed, go out your front door, and get to work. Uh, verse 16, the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. <laughs> wow. I think that's sarcasm. If I'm understanding the verse, the sluggard, that's another word for this slothful, lazy person. A sluggard is wiser in his own conceit. In other words, he's lazy, and he's making excuses, and he's a know-it-all. And, and, you know, so he, he thinks he's wiser than seven men that can render a reason. Seven men, that's just a lot of people that are, are not like him, that are, that are actually 
re reasonable, diligent, hardworking people, this sluggard still thinks that his way is the best way. All right. Let me see how it's stated in the Amplified. The lazy person is wiser in his own eyes than seven sensible men who can give a, give a discreet answer. See, one of the things, I've said this so many times uh, as we studied the book of Proverbs, but, you know, I realize that sometimes people watch one of the videos uh, uh, and they haven't watched it from the beginning. So some of these points, I, I need to repeat them. And, and that is that uh, the Bible, most of the books in the Bible are uh, historical accounts of events in people's lives. Uh, and it's true history. Um, but then the book of Proverbs is unique in that it's not a continuous story. Um, like I just finished last night, uh, finally, uh, the study of the book of Job. 42 chapters, it's one story from beginning to end. It's, there's continuity, and, 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 and it is a true story about a real person. Uh, and but Proverbs is not like that. It's it's, it's a list of, of many statements, uh, principles, ideas, quote Proverbs, and each proverb uh, is intended to teach us some wisdom. And sometimes a proverbs is just one verse. It stands alone. You learn just from the one verse, a principle, and then. Many times, though, the, the proverb, it may be take two, three, four, five verses to express the point. So that's why the book of Proverbs is so unique. Uh, the only other book I know that's kind of like it is the book of Psalms. It's not a continuous story either, but the book of Psalms are really a book of songs. It was, it was written primarily by King David, and it was written to be... A song with music, company with music, and um, and much of Proverbs is prayers praising God and prophetic uh, uh, statements about the, the future. Uh, so Psalms and Proverbs are different than the other books in the Bible. Um, the Book of Revelation is different too, in that it's the the only truly apocalyptic book written in a, an apocalyptic style. I don't want to get too sidetracked getting into that, but uh, for the point I'm making is that most of the Bible is written as a, a story about history. And, and, and Proverbs, though, is that these, these verses here, uh, if there's 31 chapters in Proverbs, and let's say there's approximately, say, 40 verses in a chapter, uh, you, you probably have um, um, a thousand Proverbs, a thousand statements. That, that are wise, but many of these are repeated throughout the 31 chapters. Over and over again, the theme comes up comparing, don't get involved with strange women. Uh, don't be a drunkard. Don't be a fool, be a wise man. Uh, don't be lazy, be diligent. And you have a contrast between the lazy person and the diligent, the, the fool and the wise man. So that's the way the book of Proverbs goes. But some of these themes are repeated over and over again as, throughout the various books of Proverbs. Um, so now let's go to verse 17. He that passeth by and meddleth with strife, belonging not to himself, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. Uh, so that's kind of mind your own business. Uh, don't get involved in other people's battles. Now, of course, the, there's exceptions to that. If, if, the, if you see that someone is being uh, abused, you know, I think we uh, need to intervene and try to rescue someone, help someone. If someone's being bullied, we need to come to their rescue. Um, but, but overall, if, if two people are arguing and they're having strife, just mind your own business. Stay out of their ar other people's arguments. Uh, verse 17 in the Amplified says, like one who grabs a dog by the ears. Now, that's a bad idea. Dragging, grabbing any dog by the ears, um, even a tiny little dog, uh, you might regret grabbing his by his ears. Particularly if you try to grab a big dog by his ears, uh, you're going to um, probably be seriously injured 
It's foolish to do that. The point is, it would be foolish to do that. And in that way, it's also foolish to, uh, is he who passing by stops to meddle with a dispute that is none of his business. Just as grabbing a dog by his ears, you're going to end up probably suffering, being harmed, injured. You get involved in other people's disputes, then you're going to get caught up in that and you'll probably suffer some kind of injury or harm that you could have avoided if you just would mind your own business. Verse 18 in the uh, KJV says, As a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, Am not I in sport? <laughs> well, I thought I was understanding it until the very end. Uh, is that maybe it's just a joke? Maybe he's saying, hey, uh, hey, it's just a joke. Have you ever uh, have you ever dealt with someone that is like they do something and they say, wow, it's just a joke. Can't you take a joke? In the meantime, you know, you got injured in some way because then they, they say, oh, it's just a, just a joke. Can't you laugh it off? Um, let me see how it's phrased in the Amplified. Verse 18 says, like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man who deceives his neighbor, uh, acquaintance, or friend, and then says, was I not joking? So if you deceive your friends, and then you just say, well, I was just joking. Um, that is uh, playing with fire. It says, like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death. It um, reminds me, uh, many years ago, I was, uh, it was 4th of July. This is probably 30 years ago. Uh, and I was at a friend's house, and they, he had a lot of different fireworks. And he was in the street. And we were having this fireworks party and fun. And he had Roman candles. Now, you know, Roman candles are meant to be fired like fireballs shot up into the sky. But we were such fools 30 years ago that uh, we lit the fire, or the Roman candles. We paced off like a duel and turned maybe about maybe 20, 30 yards apart from each other and pointed them and fired the Roman candles at each other. And we're dodging fireballs coming us like it was it was exciting, but stupid, one of the stupidest things we've ever done. If the fireball actually was able to hit one of us, who knows how much harm that would have done. We might have been disfigured or blinded for the rest of our lives. And that's that's really, really stupid. And that's like, what if someone shot a fire, uh, uh, a uh, uh, Roman candle at someone and... and uh, and they didn't get injured, but you you just, and they were angry at you. You say, well, hey, it was just a joke. Can't you take a joke? Well, that's the kind of thing. There are certain things you just don't joke about. Um, let's go to KJV. Um, verse 20, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. Yeah. So in other words, um, a fire needs fuel. And uh, also, not only does a, can a fire not burn without fuel, it will go out. But in the same way, If someone is is not gossiping, strife will end. If there's nobody like a tale bearer, that's like a tattle tale. Somebody who goes and has to uh, tell somebody, "Oh, uh, you know what that guy said about you?" You know, and he's just trying to stir up trouble, or maybe he's even making up something. A tale bearer could be someone who's making up lies, but without that person, strife will cease. It's the tail bearer, the, the troublemaker. The, I made a, a video about some people on YouTube that used to be friends that I, 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 I label them as uh, troublemakers, just trying to stir up trouble between the brethren. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. I can't take that call because of this, but uh, uh, let me see. Where was I? Let's look at Man Ray Cass. Uh, verse 20. Verse 20. Verse 20 uh, in the Amplified, let's look at it in there. For lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no whisperer who gossips, contention quiets down. So I hope that we wouldn't be whisperers, gossipers, uh, muckrakers, troublemakers. But I've seen a lot of that here on YouTube. People trying to stir up strife among the brethren. Let's look at verse 21. As coals are to burning coals, the wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Yeah, some people just want to stir up trouble. That continues in the same thought. Verse 22, the words of a talebearer are as wounds. A talebearer is someone who's gossiping, making up lies about people. The, the words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Yeah, I've, I've experienced that. I've felt that it does a lot of harm for people to gossip. Uh, and if you are the subject of gossip, then it uh, doesn't feel good. Uh, in the Amplified, it's phrased this way. The words of a whisperer or a gossip are like dainty morsels to be greedily eaten. They go down into the innermost chambers of the body to be remembered and mused upon. Well, that's stating it a little differently. That's like the people who are listening to the gossiper. They, they really are like enjoying it and savoring it and saving up all the gossip. Verse 23 uh, and the KJV says, burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver dross. Burning lips, that's someone who can't wait to talk, I think. And a wicked heart. So if you are you have wickedness in your heart and you can't wait to talk, it's like a potsherd covered with silver dross. Okay, let's see how it's phrased in the Amplified. 23 is like a common clay vessel covered with the silver dross, making it appear silver when it has no real value, are burning lips, murmuring, manipulative words, and a wicked heart. So these are things we don't want to, to do. We don't want to be that person. And if you're that kind of person, then we, we don't want to be around you if we can help it because no good comes out of, out of uh, this uh, gossiping, lying about each other, stirring up trouble, dissension. Verse 24 in the KJV says, He that hateth dissembleth with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Hmm. Well, hmm. brings up a lot of uh, thoughts. I'm wondering what these seven abominations are, but uh, there might be referencing some other verse in the Bible there. Let me see how it phrases it in the Amplified. Verse 24 says, He who hates disguises it with his lips, but he who stores up deceit in his heart when he speaks graciously and kindly to conceal his malice, do not trust him, for seven abominations are in his heart. So it's not necessarily seven. It's just an example of that, hey, his heart is full of abominations, hatred, malice, and yet he's talking to you with a smile and being hypocritical. And Verse 26 in the KJV says, Whose hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Whose hatred is covered by deceit, 
his wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Well, I guess that person is going to be exposed publicly. Let's see, it says it in the Amplify, verse 26 says, Though his hatred covers itself with guile and deceit, his malevolence will be revealed openly before the assembly. And uh, see, so a lot of people would probably be very embar embarrassed, maybe ashamed, if they're caught and exposed publicly. But I, I think, I suspect that this kind of a person, maybe even being exposed publicly wouldn't even bother them because they're beyond even shame. Um, verse 27 Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. <laughs> There's a Greek mythological uh, figure. Uh, maybe I'll think of his name in a minute, but he rolls up a big stone up the, up a mountain, and and it and, and it rolls back down, and every day his he has to try to roll it up again. And as I think it's a picture of, of uh, frustration. Uh, but uh, this person here, uh, if you dig a pit, in other words, if you create a big problem, uh, you're going you're gonna to end up getting caught, caught up in it. If you're telling lies and being malicious and stirring up trouble and gossiping, uh, you're digging a hole for yourself and you'll end up getting caught in it. Uh, let's see how it phrases it in the Amplified. Whoever digs a pit for another man's feet will fall into it. And he who rolls a stone up a hill to do mischief, it will come back on him. So let's just stop doing these things. It's, it's going, you're going to end up not only hurting other people, but eventually it catches up with you. Let's read verse 28 in the KJV. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Okay, well, look at it in the Amplified. It says, a lying tongue hates those it wounds and crushes. A lying tongue is just a liar, a person who is speaking lies. It's a hateful thing to lie. Uh, lies, I mean, some people lie to protect themselves, but sometimes people are lying. This is talking about uh, uh, a person who's lying it hurts other people. It wounds and crushes other people. And a flattering mouth works ruin. Um, flattery is, I mean, it's, it, it's good to pay people compliments if they're sincere, but if you're complimenting people and just lying in order to try to manipulate them and, and, and gain some kind of favor, it's insincere, flat, that kind of flattery is not good. Okay, so that's that's verse uh, that's the end of chapter twenty six. I think that's a good place to stop for tonight. Um, I want to take a couple of minutes and tell you the good news about salvation. Though uh, I end every broadcast with uh, this message, uh, I'm, it's very going to be very short because it's it's easy to get saved. And if people tell you uh, you want to go to heaven, well. This is the list of things you've got to do. You've got to do A plus B plus C plus D, all that, and then keep your fingers crossed and hope that you did it well, done it well enough, and maybe God will let you into heaven. That's a lie. It, salvation is not complicated. It's not difficult. It's easy. That's why the, the word gospel is a Greek word, and it means good news. It wouldn't be good news if I gave you a, a long list of requirements and impossible tasks you had to do in order to try to work your way to heaven. That would not be good news. But the gospel truly is good news because it is simply that salvation and eternal life in heaven is offered to every one of us as a free gift from Jesus. It's a free gift. Now, if you've never never heard it stated that way before, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised because uh, almost all the people in the world today, even even people who are attending churches all over America and, and, uh, and all the people who've ever lived throughout history, almost all of them have been taught the philosophy that in order to go to heaven, you've got to work at it and be good. And if you're good enough, God might let you in. 
The really good people get to go to heaven. The bad people go to hell. So that would be salvation based upon personal merit. But that's not the salvation message we find in the Bible. That's what you're going to hear in a lot of churches. But that's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity says in order to go to heaven, you've got to trust Christ. <laughs> that's why I'm calling it Christianity rather than Christianity. Uh, a Christian is simply a person who is relying completely on Christ. A Christian is someone who says, I know I cannot get to heaven through my own efforts because uh, I'd have to be perfect. That's what the Bible says. You have to be perfect. Now, if you think that you can live a perfect life and then go before God at the judgment and say, I've been perfect. I've never done anything wrong my whole life, so I deserve heaven. Go ahead and try. But the Bible says it's impossible. It says we all fall short. So that's the first thing you need to understand, that it is impossible to get to heaven through personal merit, through religious works. And you need to reject that idea and instead just rely upon Jesus Christ. Trust him. This icon right here is an illustration of what I'm talking about. You see, if, if Jesus wants to take you to heaven, and it's as simple as, as simple as embracing him and letting him do it. You just rely on him to get you to heaven and trust him. Now, I don't want to neglect telling you who Jesus is and what he's done and why you should believe this message. The Bible says that uh, Jesus is eternal God Almighty. It says he came down from heaven. Uh, God manifest in the flesh as a man, Jesus Christ. Now, this Jesus, he lived a perfect, sinless life. And he said the reason he came down and became a man was to die on a cross for our sins. So these are two things you need to understand. When he suffered and died on the cross, he paid for our sins. The Bible says he's the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. When Jesus was suffering and dying on that cross, the sins of all people who have ever lived were put upon Jesus Christ. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, his perfect righteousness is put on us. So there's an exchange. When we believe in Jesus, uh, he paid for our sins. Our sins are put on him. His perfect righteousness is put on us. So the problem of sin is, is resolved. And that's what Jesus did for us. He, and that way, he offers us salvation. Now, why should you believe this? Well, Jesus said he would give us proof, evidence, a sign to prove that who he was and his claims were true. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be Savior. He claimed that he would die for our sins. He claimed he would be buried. He claimed he would be raised back to life. And that's exactly what happened. He, after he died on the cross, he was buried. The third day, he was raised back to life bodily. And he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days. And they, they touched him. They ate with him. They talked with him. They saw him. And so this resurrection is the sign, the proof that Jesus promised to prove he is God, he's Savior, he has power over life and death. And Jesus says that if you put your faith in him, he gives you life everlasting in heaven as a free gift. Now, the question is, will you believe him? Will you trust him? Will you rely on him? Or will you try to get to heaven some other way? If you try to get there some other way, it's impossible. Jesus said, I am the way. He said, he's the way to heaven. He said, I am the truth. He is the truth you need to believe in. He said, I am the life. If you want life everlasting in heaven, Jesus is the sole source of life. He said, you cannot come to the Father any other way but through me. He claimed he's the exclusive way to heaven. I believe him. I hope you will too. Put your faith in Jesus right now, and you are guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. Guaranteed. That's a promise from God, so you can, you can believe it. Uh, please, uh, uh, if you did put your faith on Jesus, make a comment on this video. 
And thank you for watching. I hope you will join me nightly for these uh, Bible Talk with Brother Luke, 7 p.m. Pacific time nightly. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.